This is a jingle. This is our jingle. <laughs> Welcome to the Culture Edit, content for work and more. It's a weekly roundup where we talk about the latest news in people strategy, company culture, and what's happening in the world today. Hey everyone, welcome to the second episode of the Culture Edit podcast. In case you missed it, yes, we said we're on episode two. We have our first podcast that's actually live, has been live all week. Uh, And we really appreciate all the support from our friends and even people that we don't know that have listened in uh, and given us great feedback. So on this beautiful Friday morning, before we leave to drive down to Florida, we're going to do our second episode. And I'm here with Chad, again, co-pilot. Co-pilot. How are you feeling? Good, yeah. I mean, you were right. Uh, people listened. I don't want to say it's shocking because <laughs> that, I guess I feel like, underestimates our ability. But when you put something out to the world, it's, it's definitely nerve-wracking no matter what it is. For sure. And I do want to acknowledge the Peanut Gallery um, for commenting that I sound like i am uh, been in a POW camp for the last 30 years uh, and finally got out. Uh, so yeah, I'll make sure I come with a lot more energy this time. I think it's hard cause I have a lot of that ADHD energy just coming through at all times. So maybe I make you sound a little more well, serious. Yeah. I think a couple of lessons learned. One, uh, don't record this at the end of a very long Friday, uh, after a happy hour Two, make sure that, uh, we know that we're actually going to utilize the recording because what folks may not realize is that we've recorded several different versions of different Fridays for several weeks, and we haven't used them. So I wasn't quite sure whether or not we were going to use that. Um, but this time I know that we will. So more energy, no more POW camp um, survivor. Speaking of POW camps, the experience that we had last night on the pizza ride, for those of you that don't know, that's a local group ride with about 100 people every Thursday. It is fast and furious, and I haven't done the, the quote-unquote real pizza ride in a few weeks because I've been on the injured list a little bit. Uh, but last night I was feeling good and wanted to go out there and just completely got destroyed. Went into a heart rate zone that I haven't gone into for a while. Yeah, so th- this is speaking to a very uh, select group of people out there that uh, ride bicycles. Atlanta is uh, definitely, a, from a cycling perspective, Pizza Ride is probably one of the, the most infamous, uh, over 100 people last night on this ride. and uh, It was about 50 miles by the time we got back, uh, and then you woke up from that and uh, got on the tram. Yeah, <laughs> I did. Uh, psychotic. Well, I mean, you rode outside. Yeah, well, we're driving out to Florida, and we know that that's going to be uh, limited opportunities to work out this weekend based on all of our activities that we have scheduled. The activities, though, are pretty exciting. We're going down to Tallahassee to see Chad's parents, which is really exciting. Uh, But we're also going to pay homage to his high school 30th year reunion. That's right, Lincoln High School, class of 1993, 30 years later. Hard to believe. Uh, You went to the 20-year reunion. He had just started dating 10 years ago. A lot of commentary that folks would never see you again. So I know that you're really looking forward to... uh, Showing up. Oh, I'm coming back, baby. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk in the room. I already, I, I already know exactly. I'm going to walk in the room. And I want to do like a George Costanza and just throw my, throw my arms up in the air and be like, I'm back, baby. Do you actually remember any single person that you're going to, to make sure that they remember that you're there? Or it's just kind of all a blur of old people? Yeah, I don't remember anyone. I just remember a bunch of people that looked like my parents. Okay. It's going to be fun, though. It's going to yeah. be, you know, that, like, initial awkwardness, which I kind of weirdly enjoy awkward situations. I don't know I don't know why. There's something probably in my childhood that could be dug into with that one. But Yeah, so we have a full schedule. we we got an event tonight um, with that group. Uh, tomorrow morning we're going to do a pretty long gravel ride in South Georgia. So my mom lives basically on the Florida-Georgia line, um, just like the band. And uh, we will uh, be heading up some dirt roads that way. Pretty isolated, scary, dog-infested.
congested roads, <laughs> then uh, hopefully we'll head down to my family has had a, a tract of land, a farm. Uh, basically, my grandparents have had a farm in the family for a really long time. Um, my mom and I have decided to sell that farm. It's literally been in the, the family since the 1800s. Uh, so we'll go take a look at that. It'll probably be the last time I'll ever see it. That's the kind of farm, one of the farms I grew up on. Saturday night is the big floorway where they sit on an invitation. What, what did it say? Dress to impress? Dress to impress. Dress to impress. Uh, on, these are all at restaurants I've never heard of, by the way. Uh, there was a DJ I saw, an open bar. Uh, so these, these folks from Tallahassee are pretty serious about their high school reunions. I think mainly because they never left Tallahassee, uh, and uh, this is pretty much all they've got to look forward to. I don't know anyone else other than my good friend Claire Ugetto, uh, who escaped. So we're going back with Claire. Should be fun. And then Sunday, um, I'm very excited. We're going to drive down to Wakulla River. It's about 30 minutes south of, of Tallahassee to TNT Highway. We're going to rent a canoe and we're going to canoe up the Wakulla River looking for manatees. I'm really excited about that. I've, I've been to Wakulla and done the kayaking thing before, but it's been a really long time. Maybe, I mean, I guess over a decade because maybe we did it when I was in college. I've definitely done it when I was a little kid. And I just, I love manatees. I mean, who doesn't? You, you probably did it in the park though. We're going to be way, we're going to be six miles south of the park. We're going off the grid. Yeah, we're, we're literally no cell service, middle of nowhere. It's pretty spectacular. Well, and let's talk about the, the key decision that we had to make about how we would traverse our way up and down the Wakulla Springs River, right? That's what it's called? Just Wakulla River. You, Wakulla River. You, you paddle to Wakulla Springs, which is the largest freshwater spring in the world. But are we kayaking or are we canoeing? I think we're canoeing. Uh, no. Nope, we are kayaking. This, I have PTSD from I think it was probably eight years ago when Chad and I tried to canoe together in the Nanahala, which is a little more stressful than the Wakulla River. It was a ducky on whitewater. So it's completely it was so stressful. And we, really the only time that I can remember where we fought consistently for a solid hour was about how to paddle this canoe. Yeah, well, kayak, yeah, the ducky. Kayak. Yeah. Some it's people would say that's an indicator, uh, a metaphor for marriage, but, you know, every other aspect, we're, fi we're fine. So I think it's, it's an isolated incidence to being in a um, vessel together on water. Well, for some reason, uh, you think that the person in the front is the one that's supposed to steer, which is everyone that's ever kayaked or canoed knows that that's not the case. It's the person in the bow uh, that steers, but uh, we'll uh, let you keep thinking that. No, I never thought that. That's completely false. <laughs> I know it's the person in the back, but I have control issues. And so, so you were trying to steer even though you knew you weren't supposed to steer. Because I didn't like the direction we were going. Okay. <laughs> you know this about me. I have, I, have to, I have control issues. I've admitted it. So we're doing two separate duckies. Um, kayaks. Kayaks. I don't duckies know. Duckies are inflatable, like throwaway boats that could easily pop and drown at any point. These will be actual kayaks. Okay. Two separate kayaks. That way, you know, I'm going to have my little high noon sipping on the river, enjoying myself, and being able to steer wherever my little heart chooses. It's a lot more fun to do than a canoe. Okay, so uh, what's going on this week? A uh, couple of things. Uh, you know, it's, it's conference season, so a lot of conferences happening. Sherm was last week. Burzen is this week. Uh, these are all kind of HR conference, kind of real nerdy HR stuff. We debated whether or not to go. A lot of our clients have gone uh, and went to Sherm uh, and or Burzen. Um, we basically just got too busy. But we talked to some other conferences uh, that actually we had a call earlier this week with a conference firm out of the UK that wants us to speak in the fall. We haven't done this in years now because of COVID. Uh, we did used to do it a lot before COVID. Uh, but I kind of feel like it's back. I feel like people are actually going to conferences again. Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited about it, especially if we have the opportunity to speak. I really enjoy speaking on a stage with you. It's fun. Uh, yeah, it is fun. Uh, and it's a good gimmick for us, uh, husband-wife team, talking about all things work 
workplace culture. I'd, I'd get less excited about HR conferences. I get a lot more excited about conferences that aren't HR focused, but are looking for people strategists to help them. Like, so I think we just need to look at if anyone out there uh, has an industry conference that they are thinking about going to and they think it is worth it, I'd please let us know because uh, we would be interested in going to non-people HR talent strategy conferences. Okay. And let's talk about the biggest news this week as far as workplace insights. That's actually not the biggest news this week. The biggest news this week, you forgot, we landed a new client. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's I exciting. That was going to be your number one. I guess I was just trying to get into this long and tedious report, get it out of the way, and then hit the hit the fun stuff, you know. Um, but no, getting a new client this week is really exciting. It's an interesting industry that they're in. Uh, it's a company that's been made up of multiple acquisitions over the past, I guess, year, year or two. Past few years, yeah. And frontline employees are going to be a really interesting group, very different than any other frontline employee group that we've worked with in the past? By far, like, you know, one thing we talk about is that we are industry agnostic. This client will definitely prove that because we have never, nor will we ever after this, ever probably encounter an organization that has frontline workers that do these things. We're not gonna talk about it yet until we start getting into the work. Uh, But I think the big thing for us, it's kind of a thread, a common thread with all our clients, even if we're industry agnostic, is that all of our clients have senior leaders that actually care about workplace culture and they care about ensuring that they want to improve the employee experience because they know in order to, to improve their customer experience, in order for them to be successful, they've got to really focus on the employee experience. And so this is a CEO, Mark, uh, who this is the first time this happened to us. He was a client CEO of another client of ours. Uh, he left that client after the work that we've done uh, and uh, one of the first calls he made at his new organization was to call us and uh, to bring us in. And so that's really exciting. Uh, again, a testament to, I think, the value that he sees in us, which is what we're all about. And um, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it getting started within the next few weeks. And so more to come as we learn more about this organization. Hopefully we can share more about, about them. So you want to talk about the Gallup Global Insights Report? I mean, I've tried to talk about it three times now. Okay. The big news this week, uh, the annual global insights report from Gallup, this is kind of the seminal report in terms of employee engagement. I think, I'd say probably 25 years in at this point, um, every summer they released it. They actually had their conference, or maybe it's next week. No, they had had their conference. And so they, I think they review the survey results of their conference and they release it to the rest of the world. This is the one, like there's so many surveys out there, this is the one that matters. Uh, This is the one that uh, when people strategists and executives in large organizations are thinking about how do we measure our effectiveness uh, when it comes to employee engagement, what are employees thinking, and what's our strategy for engaging our people, this is the, the, the survey that they're looking to. We've summarized it, there's a lot, lot, to go into on this report. So we try to summarize it for our friends and clients with our newsletter. Uh, so you'll be seeing that. Um, we, we have some of the highlights that we really want to focus on there. But I think it starts with no shocker. Let's talk about the things that, that aren't shocking at all. Uh, only 23% of the world's employees are engaged. That really hasn't you know, changed. It's just still incredibly low. Uh, Gallup tried to spin it as like, this is up a point or two from last year. Uh, but if you think about 23% of the world's employees being engaged, uh, it is really, really sad. On the U.S. side, it's 31% of employees that are engaged. So globally, and you, I know you dug into this, but globally, outside of the U.S. and Canada, uh, employees just aren't that happy with their work. I mean, they just, they're kind of checking the box. South Asia has us by a couple points, but... You know, the U.S. is, or North America is actually the most, one of the most engaged places in the world. What's crazy to me, because I just, I don't know if you had had me guess this, I wouldn't have, but the least engaged place in the world is Europe. Yeah. By a lot. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. It, I don't know why it surprises me. I, yeah. Think about the level of service that you get when you go anywhere in Europe. Yeah, I guess so. 
Well, I think what's interesting to me is the reason my perception is that Europe would be more engaged is because they're my perception of working there is that you have benefits, you have longer paid maternity leave, paternity leave, you have job stability and a lot more flexibility. And I know that the pay is definitely not higher than in the US, but European companies have always been toting this, we take care of our employees more through all these benefits. Yeah, so that's actually the source of the disengagement though. You know, they, they pay such a higher level of taxes for the support services. So that then leads to a perception or mindset that if you're going to take that much from me, then I'm just going to do just enough to not get fired. It's really, really hard to get fired uh, in Europe, most European countries. Uh, and so they just go through the motion. And that's why when you think about our European friends that come over to the United States, if you think about Quentin or Val or even Seb, who now lives back in, in Italy, that's what they loved about America, right? Like they loved how much people cared about what they're doing, um, but it's because they're heavily incentivized to do that and, and in Europe they're not. So that's why you get that kind of level of service uh, when you're there. Um, only 23 or what is it in the UK it's even less than that um they just break this out by Europe they don't do it by country but in all of Europe engaged is only 13 percent not engaged wow. obviously 72 percent and then actively disengaged is 15 percent I'm not sure what the difference between that is but well it's it's I'm not doing anything more than I need to versus I hate this company that's actively disengaged I mean according to this Russia is more engaged than Europe which I'm not quite sure if they get accurate numbers from Russia, but, yeah, you know. <laughs> but, you know, so let's talk about the U U.S. side. 31% engaged, 52% are quietly quitting, 17% are loudly quitting. Uh, only 31% of employees in the U.S. are thriving at work. Again, high compared to the rest of the world, but still pretty pitifully low if you think about how a business leader would look at their, their workforce. Uh, that would be a really sad thing to say that only Well, and another thing, I was, I was actually talking to a guy last night on the group ride about this. He works for Georgia Tech, and, you know, he was talking about hiring and, and retention and all of that on his team. And he was saying, I don't think people realize how much it costs to have someone turn over and have to rehire someone. Because to that point right here, it says nearly six in ten employees are actively disengaged uh, and with low engagement costs. It's $8.8 .8 trillion, or 9% of the global GDP. It's the number one source of cost for an organization. That's a weird thing for leaders to miss that. I, I think because they get frustrated with the amount of effort that they see, and that's what these numbers reflect, is that they, they don't see a lot of effort from employees. So they think there must be someone out there that if we could just find them, they'll provide me with more effort, when in reality, what they really are missing is inspirational leadership. Um, they're, they're missing the fact that employees would care uh, if the experience was different for them. And that's actually what what this survey shows as well, is you know, of those folks that are disengaged, so that's 70 some odd percent of the US, 85% indicated that if you could just change the workplace culture, pay, benefits, and well-being, like those three categories, I would stay. I would be engaged. Uh, and with 41% of that just being around changing culture, so things like recognition, communication, autonomy, trust, skills development, respect, fairness, having clear goals, those are all things that would completely change that 71% of folks that, that are disengaged. So, you know, of those people, too, they asked only if, if, now that you're thinking about leaving, which by the way, that was another kind of big surprise for this year, I think for a lot of, of people that will read this report, 71% of employees surveyed said that right now is the best time to go find a new job, which they're right. There's more open jobs, if you heard me last week, more open jobs in the United States or really in the world than there ever has been in the history of jobs. So. Employees understand that. They understand now's a good time. 75% of managers said now's a good time. And half intend to leave this year, which is really terrifying. 
for a business leader, if you if you think about half of your workforce saying, I, I think now is the time that this is the year that I'm going to leave. They then turn around and ask those people, what's going to be attractive to you? What are the opportunities that are going to be attractive to you um, for a new organization? Uh, number one was work-life balance and flexibility. Second was increased pay and benefits, which we've seen in other reports, like the Mercer report was number one. That's a result of perceptions around inflation. Uh, pay and benefits typically is in it at the top of the list, but now it is because of inflation. Third was autonomy and meaningful work, so actually knowing that what I do every day matters. Uh, and then the last is job stability, which I think is a reflection of the headlines that they see every day around layoffs, which, as we've talked about uh, extensively and you've seen in our newsletter, aren't reality of, of work life right now. It's just the, a few tech companies and some others that are, are going through layoffs. So some specific industries certainly are going through layoffs, but industry-wide or workforce globally wide, uh, that's not the case. So what else surprised you about this report? I think the big surprise, like none of the things that we just talked about other than, which weren't a surprise to us because we hear it every day uh, around how many people are, are looking to quit their job this year. I think the biggest surprise to us was the data around stress uh, and how the U.S. is tied with China, 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 Canada. Canada, which is China and Canada together. So the U.S. is tied with China and Canada for the most stressed employees in the world. Uh, in, in particular, females and those individuals over 40 are, are way more stressed than males and individuals under 40. But what was interesting is that they then evaluated those stress levels and how they're impacted by, um, or they um, sliced them by their work status in terms of whether or not they were work remotely, uh, hybrid, or on-site. And what they found was the engagement levels were no different for remote workers versus hybrid workers versus on-site workers, which I think is a huge opportunity for us to reevaluate how organizations are trying to and spending so much energy around whether or not we return to work or whether or not we're hybrid or remote. They think that that's going to move the needle on engagement, and this survey shows that it's not. That across the board, employees are at the same level of engagement, whether they're remote, hybrid, or on-site. But the big difference is how much stress that they're feeling impacts their engagement level way more than whether or not they're remote, hybrid, or on-site. Well, what I'm trying to dig into is what what are these stressors, which I'm not really finding. I think there's... Uh, a few different categories for stress. Uh, the, the first is workplace friction. Uh, technology has enabled a, a world of work where people have to always be on. And there's, um, especially for the older workers, they're not used to that. Uh, and so being on 24 seven, being expected to respond to email, Slack, Teams at all times uh, is stressful because that wasn't the case just a few years ago. I think also the advent of technology has created a meeting culture that's out of control, uh, where people are sitting in uh, Zoom meetings or Teams meetings all day long, and they're having to spend their nights and weekends actually doing the work. Uh, I think there's a category of stress around uh, perceptions and the realities of inflation and how that's impacting their lives. And then I think there's also a category of stress around expectations for performance uh, and again if you work in an organization where only 30 percent of the workers are engaged the people that are engaged are doing most of the work so that's what's happening and that's why you know what the poll showed was that if you could reduce stress it's almost four times more impactful than where individuals sit whether they're at the office whether they're hybrid or whether they're remote but that issue is what everyone's th thinking about and what everyone's talking about. And that's why we keep advising our clients. You've just got to make a decision. You've got to plant a flag and you've got to stick with it. All right. So is that it from that insights report? I think those are the big topics that for us were surprising or that are most relevant to our clients. Um, you know, another big report that came out this year, oh, sorry, this week that had nothing to do with Gallup um, was the fact that our U.S. population is now older than it has ever been. 
uh, the average age for employee, sorry, for everyone, not just employees, for everyone in the U.S. right now is 39 years old. Uh, and to put that in perspective, just back in 2000, the average age was 35, and in 1980, which doesn't seem that, that long ago to me, the average age was 30. And you asked me earlier, what, why is that happening? And the answer is um, very distinctly boomers. So the largest generation of people that um, we've ever had in, in the U.S. And, and I think around the globe, they're now getting pretty old. Uh, and as a result of advances in technology and, and medicine, uh, we're able to keep people alive much longer. And so this is significantly impact uh, the workforce crisis that we have. Um, because a lot of boomers are retiring, they're not working, and so we have more and more open jobs and less people there to fill. So that's the big news, I think, this week uh, in people's strategy and, and culture. Um, there's some other, I think, interesting tidbits in the newsletter. Um, you know, succession continues to be a topic of discussion. Uh, now uh, it's about quiet luxury uh, and how it's driving I mean, I feel like in the fashion world, quiet luxury has been the topic I don't know, of discussion for a couple of years now. It's just gained popularity. But it's, it's so it's just wearing expensive clothes that don't have logos on them. Yeah, well, yeah, it's it's expensive clothes that don't have lo logos, but it's also this focus on quality over um, flashiness. And so people are really looking into not necessarily where the products are made, but just how they're made and what they're made of. And it's supposed to be like if you're truly, you know, into this quiet luxury, if you're truly on the higher end spectrum of class and society, then you just, you can notice luxury when you see it. You don't need a logo to tell you that. That's, that is a peasantry type mindset to have to see a logo to know that it's expensive. Um, you know, whether that's right or wrong, because wrong, there's people out there that they are you know, logo mania, like that is their style. Um, and that's totally cool too, but. And people are talking about this now because of succession, which we are almost done with. Uh, don't know spoilers for us, please. Uh, we were late adopters of succession. I wasn't. Uh, Mickey wasn't, but uh, she quit watching it. And then Cause, it. Cause you wouldn't watch it with me. It reminded me too much of my former work life, uh, which uh, was still fresh. The wounds are still fresh. So uh, now, to start it, and uh, I can laugh uh, at my former life uh, being played out on television. Maybe not at that level, but pretty, pretty close. We're on the last season, so I'm, I'm pretty excited to see what happens with Cousin Greg, my favorite character. Yeah, he's hilarious. I feel like we all have a Cousin Greg in our life. And that reminds me, in TV, I think work-related, what we think is probably one of the best, if not the best, TV show, pop culture TV popular show that is a genuine representation of what it's like to have a thriving culture at work and how impactful that can be. Season two of FX's The Bear uh, was downloaded on Hulu Thursday, last Thursday. So uh, we haven't had a chance to watch it yet, um, but I can't wait. I wasn't really sure where you were going because I thought you were going to say Ted Lasso. Well, but the first season was really good, and that was a, a pretty good depiction of how culture can impact a team. And 100%. First season was great, and then it was just a slow, sad, terrible waste of time. So we haven't had any, we just quit watching. Yeah, I feel like they should have just cut it after the first season and gone out on a high note. Yeah, But, sure. you know, money. Yeah. But hopefully the bear won't disappoint us, because we love the first season, uh, and so hopefully they, they do a good job with this. Uh, I've read a few reviews, and uh, the reviews so far are like, it's amazing and outstanding. So if you haven't watched The Bear Season 1, recommend it right now. It's um, about, it's about kitchen life uh, and restaurant entrepreneurship and family uh, relationships and purpose, culture, hiring. It, it's, uh, it's, it's all of the above. It's, it's uh, amazing writing and great acting. Yeah, really is a great show. And lastly, when we posted the first episode on the social medias last week, um, 
I put out a note on mine to send in questions, uh, just anything you want us to talk about when it, as it pertains to our work and or as it pertains to being a husband and wife team, you know, owning a business, uh, entrepreneurship, all of that great stuff. You all did not pass the test. You did not pass the read test. I got so many <laughs> strange questions. <laughs> then maybe they maybe they're just directed towards me. So I think the questions are a result of who's listening, and you are right uh, in the fact that uh, our demographic has skewed millennial and Gen Z, uh, which is something for us to think about. And you know, I, I thought that more folks um, my age or older would, would be interested in some of this, and that may be the case. I think it, it, it's it's about early adopters and late adopters, and so I think we're just going to have to go with the flow when it comes to the questions. Uh, from uh, from the younger folks. Maybe I should just start my own little TikTok channel where I talk about all the, the personal things that people want to know. It's possible. Uh, I don't know if I have time for that, though. No, I don't. Well, this is a good episode. We have to run. We've got to frantically pack bikes, pack the car, put the dogs in. Uh, still haven't packed my suitcase. And drive on down to lovely uh, Tallahassee. All right, well, we'll see you all... Uh, next week.